Science World host for our online family event. We are here at Science World inside the dome. And our big question for today is what can we know about T. rex senses? Hmm. To find out, we'll experiment with our own senses. We will investigate the fossil evidence and we'll also compare what we observe to the senses of animals alive today. Ooh. Before we begin, I do want to gratefully acknowledge that we are here and Science World is located on the traditional and unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples, the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh. And today, particularly, I am uh, feeling really grateful for being on this land because this morning we got a chance to witness uh, an opening blessing ceremony for our new Sacred Journeys exhibit, where a few canoe families got a chance to canoe into False Creek uh, here at Science World. And uh, that was quite a phenomenal experience. So if you do get a chance to come out and check Sacred Journeys, uh, feel free to come on over to Science World. Oh, so much fun. Now you might notice that we have a chat over here on the right hand side. So you can uh, help us out by asking any questions that come up, by sharing any observations from the experiments that you conduct, and also just putting in any comments that you have throughout the show today. Oh, so much fun. And we we'll want you to test it out. So go ahead and type into the chat. Let's see, maybe type in uh, your names of anybody joining in today, where you're joining in from. And since we'll start with our sense of hearing, maybe start off with what is your favorite sound? So type in your name, where you're coming in from, and your favorite sound to test out that comment section there. Brian, do you have a favorite sound? I do have a favorite sound. <laughs> what is your favorite sound? Uh, I like ping. Ooh. Kind of goes ping or bong like that. Oh, so you're... Uh, I love uh, silver coins clinking together. Like oh, everything. yeah. I love that. For me, it's definitely the sound of leaves rustling in the wind. That one's my favorite. Oh, so cool. And as you notice, I'm joined here by a few friends of mine. We have Brian over here, who's my partner in crime for today. Brian, are you okay if I show yes. the audience? Oh, yeah, there we go. And you can see our lights in our studio. There's Brian over there. <laughs> amazing. And then we also have Larry here on tech. Larry, are you okay with being on camera? Oh, amazing. Oh, hello, Larry. Amazing. And Larry is doing all of our magic behind the scenes, swapping everything around and all that good stuff. Oh, fantastic. Uh, amazing. Washing hands. I love that. Uh, Braden from Vancouver. Favorite sound is a T-Rex roar. Ah, we will talk about and explore the T-Rex roar later on today, Braden. Fantastic. Uh, awesome. Koa from Mount Pleasant. Oh, I love Mount Pleasant. Oh, favorite sound is my bike re bell ringing. Ooh, I like that. And a waterfall from Chivan. Oh, but not, I do love waterfalls. I hope I see one. I think I'm going hiking this weekend. I might hear that sound myself. Oh, really cool. Okay, so we're delving in to our sense of hearing. And what did the sense of hearing look like for the T-Rex? So let's see here. I will flop it on over. And I have a challenge for you. Can you spot? I'll make it a little bit bigger for you. Can you spot the T-Rex ear? Ooh, can you spot the T-Rex ear on this Paleo Artist 3D model of the adult Tyrannosaurus Rex. I can give you a little hint. If you look at the R and then follow the R directly up and above, you might find this area that is a little bit paler. And that is actually the opening to the ear canal. So it's really cool is when we look at the skull of a T-Rex, we can definitely see that there's structures there where we could tell it had a sense of hearing on both sides of its head which is why we see on this model, we have the opening to the ear canal on this one side that we can see. So let's now compare to the ear that we have. Now, the ears that we have have this really cool, really large shape to them. They're sort of satellite dishes for sound. But if we're gonna be, okay, if we're gonna be thinking about our sense of hearing, with our sense of hearing, we're sensing sounds, but what is sound? Hmm. Okay, let's explore what sound is through an investigation that we'll do together. So I need help from my friend Brian. So I'll go and join my friend Brian over here. Larry will swap us over. Okay, I'll go over there and everyone will join us here. Oh, let's see here. I'll make sure you can hear me nice and clearly. Ba, 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 ba. <laughs> Hello, Brian. Hello. Amazing, okay. So we're exploring what is sound and we're gonna use a different sense to try to answer this question. We'll use our sense of touch so we can all grab our hands, put them lightly on our necks here, 
and I'm going to start making a sound and you're all going to join in after I start making that sound and you can try to make the same sound. Okay, you ready? You ready? Oh, amazing. Oh, that's so cool. Did you feel that? Oh, okay. Now let's compare to different kinds of sounds. Maybe um, a hybrid, like a mosquito sound. <laughs> okay, now uh, maybe a bee. Oh, super cool. Does anybody, else, do you have a sound that you want to try to get us to make all together? So everyone who's tuning in can try to make this sound. So put it in the comments. What sound do you think we should try to feel and sense? Brian, do you have any suggestions what we should try to do? Oh, uh, I feel like some kind of alarm bell right now. So it's uh, something like on a submarine to go, ah, 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 ah. <laughs> Oh, amazing. That was incredible. Oh, so cool. And anybody saying, suggesting any sounds, Larry? Not? Oh, I have another sound. Oh, you have another one. Okay, let's go for it. Uh, this is slight disapproval. <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> yeah, Larry. Caca. Oh, caca. I like that. Caca. 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 And one more. One more fire truck siren. Woo! <laughs> and get Brian a huge round of applause. That's amazing. Thank you so much, Brian. Woo. Okay, so what did you, thank you, Brian. Oh, phenomenal. What did you all feel when you felt your necks when we were making that sound? I like, Armado says, hee-haw, I love that fire truck. Thank you so much for that, Justin. Oh, fantastic. So you might've felt a little bit of movement, a little bit of vibration. So this is showing us something really amazing. That sound is vibration. Vibration, vibration. It starts with something moving back and forth like our vocal cords, and we call that vibrating. And if it's connected to some other medium like air or water, it causes those things next to them to start vibrating, start vibrating, and it causes the air to vibrate and transferring this sort of sound wave moving through the air to eventually cause the inside of our ear to vibrate, called our eardrum. Let's see if we can take a look at our eardrum here. Oh, amazing, there we go, right in the middle. So sound is a source vibrating, vibration, vibration, vibration. And when our eardrums begin to vibrate, they then, through this really cool organ here, create a signal, an electrical signal gets sent to our brain, and our brains interpret that as a sound. And what's really neat is that we can interpret different kinds of sounds. So we can interpret and we can perceive really, really low pitch sounds like this one. And these are vibrations that are really slow. And we can perceive really, really high pitch sounds like this one. And oh, which is really cool is that's because of the shape of this snail cell shape here. This is called the cochlea. So when our eardrum vibrates, it causes all of these little bones in the middle to vibrate, hitting the cochlea here. And inside the cochlea, there's little tiny hairs. And we call those mechanoreceptors because the movement of those hairs cause those hairs to then release an electrical signal via these yellow nerves here. And that electrical signal gets sent to our brain. And depending on what hairs vibrate, our brain then interprets that as a high pitch sound or a low pitch sound. And different animals have slightly different shapes and sizes of the cochlea, of this sort of snail shell shape. So that means different animals can hear a different range of sounds. Can you type in the chat, is there any animals that you know of that can hear sounds that humans can't? Ooh. Any sounds that you, any animals that you know that can hear sounds that humans can't. And even still, what's really cool is between different humans, particularly younger, really young humans and really old humans can hear different sounds as well because those hairs responsible for interpreting, receiving, and communicating that uh, high pitch sounds, those hairs are the first to start to wear down. So what we're going to do in a moment is test our personal range of hearing. 
Amazing. Very cool. Okay, so let's see. We're going to play a pitch, a really low pitch sound, uh, starting to be a relatively low pitch sound, and then increase the pitch. And then you'll be able to see once you stop hearing the sound, that's your sort of upper range of hearing. Pretty neat. And we should see that there are some younger folks in the audience who should be able to hear those much higher pitched sounds. Oh, we have uh, Armando has a doggy and Abigail is a bat. Nishat is also a bat. I love that. So these animals can hear ultrasonic sounds, sounds that are beyond the frequency range that we can hear. So let's now see our personal range of hearing. And I would suggest for you before we do start this one uh, to maybe turn your volume down just a little bit and increase it as uh, you want as we go on, just because it might be a little bit uh, loud for you when we get started. Okay, let's start in three, two, one. So I'd be looking at the number at the top, hertz is vibrations per second. Five thousand, six, seven thousand, eight. I'll raise my hand when I can't hear it any longer. Okay, do you know what number you reached? You can type in the chat, what number did you reach? How many hertz, how many vibrations per second could you hear up to? Oh, amazing, thank you so much, Larry. Ah, oh, fantastic. That's so cool. Nice. So what's really neat is, as you were mentioning, like bats and dogs, they can hear beyond our range of hearing. And what about the T-Rex? What was their range of hearing? Uh, Armando said approximately 16,000 vibrations per second. And maybe to give you some context as well, what we see is a, what we interpret as a middle C note, right in the middle, that note or the key in the middle of the piano, that is 256 vibrations per second. And we were hearing quite a few thousand, up to 16,000, and some younger folks might be able to hear almost up to 20,000 hertz. Pretty cool. Maggie has 18,000. Oh, brilliant. Oh, so cool. Okay, so now what about the T-Rex? Like what could they hear? What was their personal range of hearing? So let's take a look. There's this really cool thing that we can do is when we look at the skull of a T-Rex, here we go. There's actually this empty space in the skull where the brain would have fit in. We call that the brain cavity. And what paleontologists have done is filled in that brain cavity with a mold so that we can actually get the shape of the T-Rex brain. Okay, you ready to see the shape of the T-Rex brain? Okay. This, to me, I thought was just absolutely incredible. And what I want us to focus on, we'll definitely come back to this brain a little bit later on with the other senses. But what we can focus on is that little pink structure in the middle there, and we'll zoom in to that one. And that is actually a structure of the inner ear. Now pay attention to those loops, and we're gonna go back to the image of the human ear and see if we can see any structures that seem familiar to us. Okay, so we have these loops at the top, a little part sticking out at the bottom. And when we look at that snail shell shape going to the top, we also see those three loops. So those three loops, which are the most identifiable part of this, what we call a brain endocast, are actually responsible for a sort of secret sense that we have. I call it a secret sense because we don't often think about it too much as one of our senses, but this is a part of our inner ear that's responsible for our sense of balance. So if we tilt our head in one direction or another, or if we step and lose our footing, this is the part of our brain that tells us how off balance we are so we know where to place our foot so that we can stay upright and do things like run or with, in terms of the T-Rex, walk really quickly while it's chasing something. Pretty cool. So it had, just like us, this sort of sense of balance. And looking at the little nubbins on the bottom, that's actually the cochlear duct. And what's really cool is this structure is really, really similar in all animals with spines. But what's different is their shape, or and their size, sorry. What's different is how big they are. So based on how big the cochlear duct is, 
we can make a prediction as to how big that snail shell was, how big the cochlea was. And by predicting how big the cochlea was, we can predict its range of hearing. And what we know is that the T-Rex must have been able to hear really, really low pitch sounds, way lower than what humans are capable of hearing. So similar to dogs and bats being able to hear ultrasonic sounds, these T-Rex must have been able to hear infrasonic sounds. And I have a question for you, and you can type this in the chat. When do you use your sense of hearing the most? When do you find you're using your sense of hearing the most? Any ideas, Brian? When do you use your sense of hearing the most? Uh, watching TV. Watching TV. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. Um, escaping predators. Escaping predator. What predators are you escaping from? Oh, uh, there's some nasty raccoons in my neighborhood. There, and for my me, it's crows for sure. I love that. <laughs> Brilliant. Oh, I love that. And uh, I find for myself, I definitely turn on the subtitles on most things I'm watching now. And I went to the movie theater for the first time in a long time recently. Uh, and I'm like, what did they say? What, what was that? I didn't catch it. It's because I'm so used to reading the subtitles while I'm watching it. Um, I've sort of lost my fine tune ability to hear exactly the words that they're saying. So where? Oh, out on a walk, Nishant. Oh, amazing. Out on a walk. Nice. So when you're observing, so we can use our sense of hearing to observe the world around us, to identify those things. So our brain immediately starts to interpret, oh, that's the sound of a bird around the corner, or that's the sound of uh, my mom calling me for dinner, or that's the sound of somebody's uh, bike, um, their bike bell ringing at birthday parties. Oh, amazing. <laughs> yeah, totally. Uh, in birthday parties, when you're at a party, you're talking to a lot of your friends. You're maybe singing with a lot of your friends. So you're coordinating what words you should say when. So it's sort of used for communication a whole lot. So we use our sense of hearing to observe the world around us, to identify things in the world around us, but also to communicate. And this is exactly what came into the minds of paleontologists who could see that the T-Rex could hear really low pitch sounds. So they thought likely they would have made really low pitch sounds. So it brings us to the question of what sounds might the T-Rex have made? Let's see. Oh, I love this. Abigail says, in the dark. That's a really good one. So I'm going to get you all to make a prediction. And Brian, in a moment, is going to come on camera and show us. But I want you to make a prediction. What sounds do you think the T-Rex made? And then we'll go and see some other animals. So what sounds do you think the T-Rex have made? You can try to make the sounds yourself. And uh, we'll cut the camera over to Brian. Brian, what yes. T-Rex sounds do you think the T-Rex might have made? Uh, I think a T-Rex might have made a sound like this. Hello, my name is Jeremy. I am a Tyrannosaurus <laughs> Rex. Nice to meet you, Jeremy. Or it may have made a sound like this. <laughs> Or, those are my three predictions. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Brian. We can all give Brian a huge round of applause. Thank you, Brian. Oh, beautiful. Oh, so good. Whew. So, any ideas what sounds might a T-Rex have made? We might be thinking, of course, of maybe something that we've seen before, like in Jurassic Park, of their big, like, roar. and. What's really fun, something that we can do is mix together uh, these calls of different animals that are alive today to make our own predictions. But the idea of a T-Rex roaring, that's actually a very mammal thing to do. So if we think of the big predators that are alive today, like lions. Lions have this nice big roar, or bears have this nice big roar to them, which is pretty cool. So, um, but when we look at, say, crocodilians or birds, they might not necessarily roar. They have different ways of making sounds. And so paleontologists are thinking that what are some sounds are, that are common among both crocodilians, like crocodiles and alligators, and birds? And let's take a look at some animals that are alive today, and they make these sounds called closed mouth vocalizations. And there are, through that, they're able to make really deep sounds and this is what paleontologists are thinking the sounds that the T-Rex might have been able to make. So let's first take a look at a grouse. This is an animal that is all around the North Shore in Vancouver. And if you're going hiking, you'll probably hear this sound. Oh, 
Oh, amazing. That's a grouse sound. I love the sound of a grouse. So they have this sort of pouch, internal pouch. They're passing air into and squeezing to make these really deep bellows, these really deep sounds. And we're going to take a look at an alligator now and see what kind of sounds it would have made. But alligators are really cool. Alligators made these extremely deep sounds. They actually made sounds that are too low for humans to hear. So when I show you this alligator making a bellow, first take a look near its back. You'll notice those low pitch sounds are causing the, air, the water to move and dance around. And then you'll hear an audible bellow from the alligator. So let's take a look at this really deep infrasonic sound that if we were in its presence, you wouldn't be able to hear with your ears, but you'd be able to feel those vibrations. So let's take a look. Oh, incredible. Oh, so much fun. Okay, now paleontologists thought they would take the sound that the alligator makes and bring it down in pitch so that we could see what a T-Rex bellow might sound like. So what we're going to do is we're going to go on over to a T-Rex bellow. We ready to go over? Awesome, Larry. Can we get it a little louder? Just crank the fader, please. Okay. That's ominous. Oh, incredible. Amazing. So one of the paleontologists there, one of the sort of audio designers, uh, something that they mentioned, which is quite amazing, is that this might be the first time in like 66 million years that this sound has been heard by another animal. Quite amazing. So this is something that it's incredible about the field of paleontology. We get to look at animals alive today, our own senses, and try to predict what was life like for a T-Rex and what kinds of sounds might it have made. Oh, pretty phenomenal. So we also actually have a secret sense sort of hidden in our sense of hearing that I absolutely love. And you might notice this. We're not going to do a big experiment for this one, but what you can do is close your eyes and create sounds around you and you might notice that you're able just with your sense of hearing locate the relative direction that that sound is coming from but also relatively how far away is that sound being made so we use our sense of hearing to actually find out where things are in the world around us and create a little bit of a map of the world around us now there are some animals who can do this really really well and those animals are like bats and dolphins, these animals can echolocate. So they're not just hearing the sounds that are coming from the world around them, they're actually creating sounds and listening to the very quiet echo that's being bounced back. And they actually hear, ba -ba -da -ba, ciao. They actually hear the texture of something like a moth flying around. So they make a sound, dee -dee 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 -dee, or they make ultrasonic sounds that we can't hear. And then they bounce off of things and they can see where things are to the extent that they can actually chase and catch a moth and tell the difference between a moth and a leaf just from the sound of its echo. Now, a T-Rex likely wouldn't have had echolocation, but just like us, it probably, because it had an ear on either side, it probably had this general sense of where that sound was coming from and roughly how far away the sound of the source of those vibrations were pretty cool. And really fun tidbit here, there's actually some humans who have learned how to echo locate, which is pretty amazing. Some of them have had visual impairments and when they're put under an fMRI, when they're being, um, when they put on headphones and hear recordings of echoes, particularly of echoes of sounds that they've made in the past, we notice that the areas in their brain responsible for vision light up and activate as if they're seeing something. It's pretty phenomenal. Okay, so our sense of hearing is one of my favorites. There's a lot to do with our sense of hearing, which is really fun. So we'll go on to our sense of sight. So you can look at the world around you now, and you might notice a few really fun things. Up here first, try this out, and Brian can try this too. So if you maybe close one eye, point to something in the distance, anything in the distance. I'll point to Larry. And now you have one eye closed. I want you to switch which eye is open and which eye is closed. Boo! Whoa! I'm no longer pointing at Larry. But if I open the other eye again, ah, there we go. 
So what's happening is you're getting two different images, two different two-dimensional images that are being overlaid by your brain. Your brain is putting those two images together to create a sense of depth perception. And so when you're looking at objects in the space around you, you can actually perceive these 3D objects, which is pretty cool. You can also sense all of the colors that are around you. And maybe I can also ask, can you see texture? Mm, that's a weird one. Or can you see sounds? That is a weird question. Okay, here, let's try this out. Larry's going to mute me in a second. I want to see if you can sort of see this sound. Okay, you ready, Larry? Mute me. Amazing! So you didn't quite hear. You weren't really using your sense of hearing, but your brain is really good at trying to guess what's happening and try to in interpret the kinds of sounds that are being made by what you can see, which is pretty cool. And some people are really good at it and can actually lip read, uh, which is quite phenomenal. Awesome. OK, so with our sense of sight, let's see. I want you to let me know what is the difference in the eyes of these two cats? Can you see a difference in the eyes of these two cats? So we have the colored part here, that is the iris. And then we have the dark part in the middle. That's actually a literal window inside the eye so that light can get into the eye. And that iris there. So we have the iris and the pupil in the middle. Does anybody see a difference between those two there? So what's really cool is, one of them is really slender. Oh, the black. The black is different. So one of them is really, really big, and the other is really, really small. And we actually have this ability as well to change the size of the opening that goes into our eye. And when we go into a really, really bright space, there's too much light going into our eye, so our pupils actually contract. That window gets smaller. And when we go into a really dark space, our pupils get bigger. And likely the T-Rex would have walked around and would have been in a shady forest area and would have needed to get more light into their eyes. And then maybe they would go outside of the forest into a nice big open field, into a bright sunny day. So likely they would have had pupils that dilated and contracted as well. And this is an experiment you can do in the bathroom. I'll show you a quick video. If you do this one in the bathroom, if you can reach your light, you can look in the mirror and turn off your light and then turn it on. You can actually watch your own pupils dilating and contracting. And that's from the iris actually okay. moving around. <laughs> oh, Love that. Ba -da -ba! And inside the eye. Da -da 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 so just like our we had mechanical receptors where there was in our ears where there was little hairs that moved around and sent an electrical signal, these are photoreceptors receptors that are cells that are inside of our retina, that yellow part and the inside of our eye that have these cones and rods or these cone cells and rod cells. And when light hits them, they send an electrical signal to our brain to tell us we are seeing light. Now those cones are responsible for telling our brains that we're seeing color. So we have a cone for red, blue, and green. And then those rods are responsible for our night vision or our low light vision. So it doesn't take a whole lot of light to activate those rods. Now, it's really neat. There are some animals that can see different colors than humans can. Ah, like I think it's a mosquito can see in infrared. So anything that gives off heat is giving off a color of light that we can't see with our eyes, but mos mosquitoes can. So humans actually glow in the dark in infrared. And we look like a candle in the dark to mosquitoes in the night. That's pretty cool. I love that. Let's see how oh, nice Roy was saying before. One is bigger. So we can actually see in this diagram the iris over here. Nice. Is the part that opens and closes, changing the size of that pupil. Pretty cool. Now, what's really neat is since our uh, color receptors take a lot more light to activate when we're using our night vision, you might not have noticed this before, but your night vision is actually in black and white. 
Oh, pretty cool. Because it takes more light than exists in the room around you in order to activate those colors. Oh, nice. Mantis shrimp. Oh, so much fun. Mantis shrimp might be able to see other colors of light that we can't see. Oh, really cool. Nice. So we're thinking about this night. Have you ever seen an animal that their eyes glow in the dark? This is a weird one. Oh, I've seen like raccoons and cats sometimes do this when a light shines shoo, in the dark. I see their glowing eyes. Now, some animals, they have these reflectors in the back behind their retina that is called the tapetum. Now, this gives, so if light goes in and passes by one of the receptors and doesn't activate one of the receptors, it hits the back of the eye. And for us, it gets lost. But in these animals with tapetums, with this reflector on the back of their eyes, it gets bounced back and has a second chance to be detected by the receptors. So that means, say, cats who have these tapetums sees the world a little bit brighter, which is pretty cool. So here's the difference between a human and a cat's vision, which is pretty sweet. Now, what about the sight of a T-Rex? Well, its eyes, because oh, the only information we have is how big the eye sockets are and where they're located on the head. So based on the size of the eye sockets, there are Adult eyeballs would have been around the size, a little bit bigger than a tennis ball, which means there's a lot of room for a lot of receptors. So likely, they had slightly better night vision than us. Also, their lenses were physically bigger, so they would have been able to see farther than we can. And because their eyes are on the front of their head and a little bit on the side, they would be able to have better the peripheral vision than humans can, but also they would have better depth perception than we can. So let's do an experiment on our own depth perception. So we need a couple pencils for this one. Uh, you can have just one pencil if you wanted. And I'm going to go over to my friend Brian to help me out with this one. So let's see. I will go over here, Brian. OK, so Brian, you are going to grab one of those pencils. And you're going to hold it straight out. Nice. And you can come just a little bit closer. Fantastic. Thank you, Brian. OK, now this is person one. So person one can be in the room right now, and you can hold up the pencil just like this one. Person two, just like me, you're gonna bring out your hand and you're gonna close one eye and you're gonna try and see if you can poke the pencil from the side, just like this, from the side. So I'm gonna poke it in three, two, one, go. Oh! Okay, okay. And then Brian, change your distance around just a little bit. Okay, and I'll close the other eye now, see if the other eye is a little bit better from the side. Oh, I just missed. Oh. Okay, now I'll have both eyes open. Ooh. Oh, super easy. So the fact that we have two eyes with that seeing the same thing from different perspectives, we are able to perceive depth and be able to see, okay, how far away is this thing so that we can grab it ourselves. Now, I'll give you a couple minutes to try this yourself, Brian. We will swap as everyone at home is trying this out. So I'll hold the pencil for you. Oh. you. You. Oh, you almost got it. Your fingernail got it. Nice. Love it. Oh, fantastic, Brian. Amazing. So I'll give you about 30 more seconds to try this out at home. <laughs> and we can swap back. Thank you so much, Brian. Oh, brilliant. Oh, Brian's trying it out again. Oh, amazing. <laughs> So when somebody else is holding it, it's definitely a lot tougher, for sure. So because we have these two eyes that's looking at the same thing from different perspectives, we have pretty good depth perception. But because the eyes of a T-Rex were much farther apart and they were forward facing, they could have an amazing depth perception, even with things that were really far away. Nice. So with big eyes, forward facing, great peripheral vision, they could see really far. And they probably had a pretty good night vision as well with a lot of sense receptors in their eyes. Amazing. OK, now their sense of touch. I have a weird question for you. We're looking at a T-Rex right now. And I want you to imagine, how might this T-Rex open a birthday present? Mm -hmm. What parts of its body might it use to open that present? There's like wrapping, maybe there's a bow. Mm. 
So for me, I know I use my hands. I don't really use my mouth to do it. Hmm. Now, what can we say about their sense of touch? We can think about what parts are more sensitive to touch than others, and likely the parts that they use to navigate the world around a little bit more were likely more sensitive to touch. Nice, amazing. So if you have any predictions as to how the T-Rex might open that birthday present, feel free to type it into the chat and we'll see what that might look like. Nice, with its mouth. Nice talk, love it. Now let's take a look at the human brain. Ba -ba! Oh, wonderful. Okay, so this is really good. One of my favorite things about the human brain is that there are specific regions responsible for specific tasks. Nice, Armando is thinking foot as well. I like that, oh, super cool. So it might lift up one foot while it balances on the other and sort of navigates trying to untie that bow nice and gently without ripping the wrapping paper because it wants to save it for later. <laughs> Love it, it's amazing. So this actually diagram of the human brain is showing us a region just right here. And it's responsible for a sense of touch of the different parts of our body, like our neck, our head, our shoulder, our arm. And you see this big region for our, our hands, our specific fingers there take up quite a bit of space in the brain. And I'm gonna show you a map of the human body where the parts of our body that are bigger are representing the parts that are more sensitive to touch. So let's take a look. Wow! <laughs> this one is quite crazy. So the hands are massive, the lips and the tongue and the ears are huge. That's because those are the parts of our bodies that are way more sensitive to touch. Whereas our backs and our butts don't have as many touch receptors on them. So our touch receptors are another mechanoreceptor, a receptor that responds to our feeling or compression or movement. And we actually have a hidden sense in our sense of touch, and that's our sense of temperature and pressure, which is pretty cool. So not only can you sense, ah, something is touching me, you can sense if it's pressing down quite hard on you or really, really lightly. And if you touch something cold, like a cold drink, or pick up a tea or a hot chocolate, you can tell that those, the contents of those cups are either hot or cold, pretty cool. Now, we're gonna do an experiment now. We have two pencils. I'm gonna go over to Brian. Brian's gonna help me out and you're gonna do this experiment at home to see how good your sense of touch is in the different parts of your body. Okay, Brian, are you ready? All right, we'll move on over to Brian. Let's see over here. Waha! All right, Brian, so what we're going to do is um, I'll grab the pencils first. And you, person one, will hold out your arm just like this. Nice, and you'll hold out your hand. Beautiful. And I'm gonna put these two tips of these dull pencils on Brian's hand. And sometimes it'll be two, sometimes it'll be one. Brian has to guess, am I touching Brian with one pencil or two? Amazing, okay. But of course, if Brian is using another sense like an eyes, Brian, of course, we'll know. So Brian, you're going to turn your head away. And I want you to let me know, one pencil or two. All right, and we'll bring your arm down just a little bit. Okay, there we go. One pencil or two. One. One pencil or two. Two. One pencil or two. One. 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 One multiple times. <laughs> One. Okay, now we'll move to the hand. Uh, one. Oh. Two. One. Two. And lastly. One. Amazing! Nice! Thank you so much, Ryan. Yeah! <laughs> so, definitely, I'll give you a couple minutes to try this at home with a partner is really good. So one person puts their arm out and looks away and the other takes two dull pencils and try to touch at the same time with either just one or two and see how far apart can the pencils go with the person still thinking that it is just one pencil. So because we have less receptors in our forearm than we do with our fingertips, we can go a lot farther apart with our pencils before the person knows that it is two separate things. And the same thing is true with the back as well that we can try a little bit later on. Nice, Brian, do you wanna try it on me? 
Okay, let's see. One. 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 Oh, two. Two. One. Two. One. <laughs> two. Ooh, that was a good one. Nice. Thank you so much, Brian. Oh, phenomenal. Okay. As we let you finish up that experiment, I'm going to go on back. Brian, thank you so, so much. <laughs> oh, brilliant. Okay. Whew. Oh, that was a lot of fun. Nice. So you're finishing that up that experiment at home. Definitely try it out. I really love that one. And it's cool to just experiment with different parts of your body, of course, gently to see how sensitive is that part. Ah, phenomenal. Okay, now what about the T-Rex sense of touch? So let's take a look at the T-Rex face because some people noted, ah, okay, they're probably going to be navigating the world with their mouth a lot more than they are their tiny little arms. So when we look at a fossil of their um, snout as well as their jaw, we actually see these tiny little holes and indentations just above their teeth here and on their jaw just below their teeth. And if we compare it to alligators and crocodiles, they have very, very similar structures on their skulls. And on crocodiles and alligators, they're actually places where nerve, nerves travel through uh, that are connected to touch receptors. So crocodiles and alligators have extremely sensitive snouts. And so because of this commonality between their skulls, paleontologists are thinking that the T-Rex snout would have been extremely sensitive to touch. Kind of like how our fingertips are extremely sensitive to us in comparison with our forearms. Ah, brilliant. Okay, now lastly is our sense of smell. And we're going to pair this one with our sense of taste. Because for us humans, those are really closely related. So we can take a look. Wah! This is the nose of something rather familiar, a dog. And if we take a look inside of a dog, we have its nose, its inner structure of its nose. And you can see that there's this part. And we have something quite similar. There is this olfactory epithelium. Olfactory just kind of means sensory or the sort of nose smelling sensory parts. And then epithelium is kind of like skin. And what they have is these receptors that bind to specific molecules that tell them, oh, hello, I'm smelling this particular molecule and send a electrical signal to our brain to tell our brain we are smelling a particular smell. So if we get a whole bunch of molecules in combination. We're like, oh, that's my aunt's famous oatmeal chocolate chunk cookies. Oh, I love that. That's delicious. And what's really mean? we can take a look to see whew, the similarity between the two. Pretty cool. And you can see those over here. And there's actually this part called the olfactory bulb in our brains. And in a dog or any sort of canine, it's about three times larger than that of humans. So we have a pretty good sense of smell, but not as good as some other animals. And if we go back to the T-Rex brain, and it, the shape is actually quite familiar comparing to other animals alive today. So we know which region is responsible for smell. And the region that's responsible for smell, that olfactory lobe that's on the right-hand side of this T-Rex brain here, is actually massive compared to the size of the brain. So we know that the T-Rex must have had an incredible sense of smell. Now for our last demonstration experiment that we'll do today, we will see if we can taste and smell something by changing the flow of air to our nose. So in this T-Rex diagram right here, we can see that when they breathe in through their nose, some of that air goes into this olfactory area here where all of those olfactory receptors would have been placed sending signals to right in the front of the brain, those olfactory lobe. And the rest of the air, that big arrow going down, is going into their lungs so that they can breathe. Pretty cool. Nice. OK, so let's do this experiment where all of us will try this one out. If you have something sweet, small, uh, would be really good uh, to use for this experiment. We'll be using Bean Boozled, so we have no idea if the jelly bean that we're eating is good or if it's nasty or not. Okay, so I'll go over to Brian and we'll do this one together. Okay, Brian. <laughs> Brian is still testing out your sense of touch. I love it. Thank you so much, Brian. Oh, brilliant. Okay, so Brian, bean boozled. Have you had a bean boozled before? Yes. 
which ones are your favorites? I have no favorites. They are all terrible. <laughs> Um, I actually quite like toothpaste. I was a big fan of toothpaste. So I'll make sure not to get those particular ones, like the blue ones. Okay, so here's the experiment. If you have your small food item, try this one out. We are going to grab in a moment a bean boozled jelly bean. So go ahead and grab one, Brian. I can open this up if you didn't like the look of those available colors there. Nice, cool. And I'll grab this one. Uh, this brown one seems like a dangerous one. Okay, so which one do you have? I have, oh, oh dear. Ooh, uh, I think that's bark or peach. I know which one it's going to be. <laughs> uh, let's see, how do you, do you really know? I don't, but I know <laughs> statistically I often do the bark or peach one and 90% of the time I get bark. Hmm. Well, let's let's hope for peach. We're hoping. Okay, so we have what do I have? I have liver and onions, <laughs> or cappuccino. I'm really gunning for cappuccino. Okay, so what we're gonna do, and you can do this at home as well, is take your food item, whatever it might be, and you're gonna first plug your nose. So we're gonna keep our sense of smell closed for this one, and only be able to taste. We're gonna chew, 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 and after a few seconds. We'll open up our nose. Okay, are you ready, Brian? I'm so ready. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what is it? Bar for a cap? What is no liver and onions or cappuccino? And then you have bar or peach. Okay, three, two, one. Chew, chew, chew. Oh, I can taste it's quite sweet. Three, All right. Huh? Add three, two, one. <laughs> <laughs> peach, mm. peach. Mm. Um. Um. Um, I'm trying to focus on the onion. <laughs> oh, it's so oniony. It's like a lot. I don't know why I'm still eating it. Mm. I'm curious about that as well. Uh, I think I want to. Oh, I like the toothpaste one. So I'll. Mm. Okay, good. That was definitely toothpaste. So it's just like I brush my teeth, right? Mm -hmm. So what did you notice? What did you notice, Brian? At first, it just was sweet. Mm -hmm. I couldn't tell anything else. And then, yeah, when the nose opened up, it's like, oh, it's kind of peachy. Peach, oh, yeah, exactly, know. right? So our sense of taste, if what we normally think of our sense of taste is actually really closely related to our sense of smell. So when those little molecules go up into our nose and that airflow mixes in, we start to taste a lot more than we realize. Pretty cool. Awesome. Brian, thank you so much for helping us out. Oh, this is so much fun. All right. So that was our last experiment today. We've seen a lot of quite amazing things about the Tyrannosaurus Rex. Its sense of sight, touch, smell, and taste. We got its sense of hearing, which is pretty cool, and its uh, sense of smell. So phenomenal sense of smell with that huge brain lobe, huge eyes that give it really great depth perception, probably pretty good night vision as well. And it had a very, very sensitive snout. And its sense of hearing, quite similar to our own, except it could sense a really low-pitched sound, which means that it likely made a really low-pitched sound as well, which is really cool. Now, the next step is to see if we take a look at how those senses might have changed over its life between, say, when it was a baby. How are its senses different as maybe a one-year-old? Or how did those senses change when it became a four-year-old and grew up? And then those senses became what we explored today as the adult. Pretty phenomenal. Okay, we have a few minutes for you to ask questions, any questions that you have that you wanna, that you're wondering about with your own senses, the senses of other animals or the senses of the Tyrannosaurus Rex. So we'll leave it open for a few minutes if you wanted to chat, but I wanna thank you all for joining us today. We know a lot about our own senses now, a lot more than hopefully than we did before. And of course, a lot more about the senses of the Tyrannosaurus Rex. What I absolutely love about our own senses is the more we explore our own senses, because our senses are the way that we experience the physical immediate world around us. So the more we experiment with our own senses, the more we get to explore and discover new qualities of the world around us. Amazing. And <laughs> oh, amazing, Armanda was mentioning it was hard to taste when the nose was closed 
And Armando was also saying that it was hard to swallow as well. Oh, very cool. So when you close that nose, because that airway, that open airway isn't there, it's actually really hard to swallow. Oh, I've never really thought about that, Armando. Pretty cool. So if you have any questions, we'll stick around. But otherwise, thank you so much for coming today, everybody. And again, we want to thank you so, so much for joining us. Have an amazing day. And keep wondering, keep smelling, keep seeing, keep hearing. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Larry. Thank you so much, everybody. And we'll stick around for a few more minutes to answer any questions. Woo! Have a great day. Nice. Boo -boo. Oh, so much fun. Brian, what was your favorite part? Oh, uh, I got enjoyed making T-Rex noises. <laughs> that was fun. That was fun. It was really weird. I never really thought about the T-Rex making other sounds besides a rah sound before. But definitely I've seen grouse on the local mountains before making their sort of bellows. Pretty cool. Nice, amazing. So we'll send some emails after for those who've registered. So if you do have any questions that we don't get a chance to answer right now, we will be able to answer them and send them in an email afterwards. We'll also send you some links and some resources to some of the fun activities that we've done. We have a resources webpage that I think Larry can bring up here, scienceworld.ca slash resources, to try out a lot of the activities that we've done and more that we didn't have time for. So thank you so much, everybody. Have an amazing rest of the day.